everybody, it's David Bear, winebear.net, and uh, Wine Conversations, and I'm really, really excited to be doing my very first on-location interview. Uh, I'm here with the Monroes, Tom and Kate, and we are inside the Southeast Wine Collective, where their wine label, Division Wine Company, is produced, along with other wines, and we're going to learn all about that in the next half hour. So, welcome, guys, or... Thank you for inviting me to your place, I guess I should say. Thank you for being here. It's yeah. really a pleasure. This mm -hmm. has been fun. Thanks to do this for this. Well, it, I'm, I'm glad it has been fun. I hope that the, the next half hour will be fun, too. <laughs> I'm sure we will. It's really rainy outside, so anything's going to be better than that. <laughs> well, cool. So um, I want to um, start with the discussion about where we are. We are not in wine country. We are actually sitting in the middle of Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And we are at least a half hour away from um, the first, you know, uh, vineyards that are in our in our region. And I want to understand how this whole urban wine, urban winery thing works. Can you give me a little bit of background on, on what this is all about? Yeah. Um, should you start with the beginning of the story of how we got here um, and or how we decided to put our winery in town? What do you think? I think it's kind of interesting to know a little bit about the history of just a winery in a community and then maybe that can morph into how this became what is now sure. an urban winery. Yeah. And and realistically wineries and communities are as old as the wine industry is in general. And so for us, we started our winemaking careers in the old world in France. And wineries are yeah. in towns there. They yeah, really okay. are. I mean, now maybe they're not a million person town mm -hmm. like we are here in Portland, but it really started with you've got, you know, vineyards around a community and what limited infrastructure there was in, you know, two, three, four, five thousand years ago was mostly in the communities. And so that's where it made most sense to do the kind of what we call production side of the winemaking where the the grapes are turned into wine. And so um, that was the experience we had. And so yeah, the, this idea of a winery in town is really old, yeah. actually. Um, and it's really different, I think, from what Americans think of, though, when it comes to wine and wine countries. Um, you know, when automatically um, you think of Napa, you think of beautiful estates, rolling vistas, um, and-, and really you know, giant, nice, chateau-ass winery. Mm -hmm. Sitting on a huge mm -hmm. plot of land. Mm -hmm. um, and actually that's where our, sort of Tom and I first met um, and fell in love with each other and also started this idea of wine is in the California wine country. We were living in San Francisco at the time. Um, but that then soon moved to us um, deciding to move to France and to learn how to make wine there. Mm -hmm. um, and then seeing just that completely different model of winemaking and how it was really based on these villages and where people made wine. And certainly that's the, the part of France where we, we made wine. Yeah. So uh, Burgundy, Beaujolais, and, um, okay, and, the, and different yeah. parts of the Loire. So mm -hmm. Bordeaux is set up a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, but the places that we made wine were really more urban village-based wineries. Um, and um, that's who we are as people. We are, um, I don't know, convivial. We really love being in town. We really love being close to things. We love being close to coffee and bread and our friends and the movies. And our community. Our yeah. community. Yeah. Um, and so when it came time to think about starting our own winery, we seriously considered putting one down in the valley. We did. We, I yeah. mean, we looked and we looked and we looked and we almost put the trigger once. Yeah. It um, was, it was, I mean, that was what you do here. Yeah. And that was what was most typical and, and where most of the resources were as far as people in the wine industry and, you know, all of the really, you know, various supply networks that are beside that as well. And so, you know, but what, you know, what Kate was saying was essentially that that wasn't really who we were. I, I, I tell the story that yeah. um, that we almost thought about a property and we came very, very close. Um, and that I woke up one morning and I said, Tom, I think I need to be really honest with you. I think that you're going to end up dead and I'm going to have killed you. And no one's going to know. <laughs> because it's going to look like you hung yourself. Or, or that we were out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> 
and, and, tractor and yeah exactly mm -hmm. you know he's out back somewhere <laughs> and maybe this is just because of the distance of living in town and having to go out to the, it's so much the distance yeah. of living in town it's the it's the proximity of connections uh -huh. that we've you know that i mean our lives have been spent you know in different communities and the relationships we build there and, and one is social mm -hmm. yeah and, and there's something for us about being out there on an island by ourselves in the middle of a vineyard that just wasn't how we enjoy wine. Sure. sure. So yeah. you've, you've basically created the lifestyle that you wanted and get to work Indeed. doing the work that you want to do yeah. in, in the environment that you're in, and that's great. I mean, we, we, when we moved to France, we realized we adored this industry. We adored working with wine, working with grapes. The people are amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... It's, I mean, we make alcohol for a living. Like, it's yeah. not a bad thing. So. Well, yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, that just... But, like, for me and Kate, it was like, hey, we've got this world where there's a social interaction, mm -hmm. there's a product that we love, and there is both science and art. And, you know, all those things have to come together for it to work right. And, and then So I, I want to just backtrack and, and understand the chronology of what brought you here yeah. so so we're here in this uh, this urban winery that there's another aspect that we haven't even talked about which is one that you share it with others mm -hmm. and we'll get to that in a little bit but I want to uh, now jump back to um, California back to France back to New York and wherever else you, <laughs> yeah. you've lived and understand the chronology of, of what ultimately brought you here mm -hmm. so so where does the story begin well, it, it did start with a stolen glass of wine. <laughs> That's true. Are we allowed to air that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he stole it from, he stole it from I, me, I, so it's yeah, fine. I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that we've passed any you know legal boundaries as far as... It's fine, I forgave you a yeah. ago. I actually married you too, so it's totally cool. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, so Kate, Kate and I met in San Francisco in the Bay Area, and... Um, we have a mutual friend who is having a birthday party on um, a boat cruise, essentially a booze cruise around mm -hmm. the San Francisco Bay on Labor Day weekend of 2005. It glamorizes a little bit, but that's yes. fine. It was a fishing trawler with a bunch of beer on it. Yeah, and one bottle and of wine. one bottle of wine. That I brought. <laughs> which Kate brought. And then subsequently hid, because I looked around and was like, no, I, nobody should drink this wine. I can, I can tell two things from this story already. <laughs> One that you're clearly married, <laughs> and one that you've told, and two that you've told the story a lot. So. <laughs> so. A, a few people have heard it, but it's, it's a, a great story. It's a great story. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 yeah. If you think about all the different ways people meet each other uh -huh. in the world, like it's kind of unique over stolen wine. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but I poured myself a. A, a, a glass at my own pleasure and well he found it which is so weird because I definitely <laughs> hidden it which is so strange I anyway I don't remember if it was hidden that well <laughs> uh, but uh, and you know the hand slap mm -hmm. of hey that's not yours <laughs> that kind of started it all <laughs> um, and I was uh, very enamored with Kate and chatted with her most of the rest of the boat ride then we went on cruise. a date a couple of days later and it I literally had just had an Oregon Pinot Noir for the first time, not two weeks before that, and mm -hmm. thought it was incredibly more interesting than the ones that I was drinking from California. And by this time, um, I was kind of a wine nerd, mm -hmm. just trying okay. to learn, you know, and it, mostly through experimentation, yeah. just drinking as much as I could. So in our first <laughs> date, you ordered, or we ordered, decidedly, yes. uh, a bottle of Oregon Pinot. Yeah. It was... Um, it's cloud line actually. I think, the it, was the, I think it was the first year vintage that they made it. Yes. Um, and it was lovely. Yeah. It was really lovely. Um, and my father is a huge Oregon Pinot Noir fan. Always okay. has been. Um, it's just a Pinot Noir fan in general. And um, had, when we moved to the States, had gotten into Domaine de Loin And uh, we had that wine at home um, a lot growing up, which was awesome. Um, and so we should say, if for those who don't know, Cloudline is made by, by Devon Dry. It's their yes. second label, exactly. Yeah. Um, and um, so that was the start of that. We got married soon thereafter. And that was kind of an important part of the Oregon connection as well. Um, we had both grown even more into Oregon wines after that, and 
Um, we yeah. got married in, in Healdsburg, California, in the heart of Sonoma. Um, and we had all Oregon wine at our <laughs> Sonoma County wedding. How scandalous. <laughs> yes. Scandal. Absolute scandal. But, but I mean, at that point, we, we were had, revoked. I, I didn't know that they actually that. let Oregon wines into the States. Yes. Uh, we, yeah, we joined the wine club. I think that was the only way that that, that was going to happen. Um, it was all shipped to our house uh-huh. very hush hush. It was. Cases and cases of it. It was awesome. Uh, we still have some. We enjoy a bottle on our anniversary every year, which yeah, is lovely. Okay. Um, anyway, so um, fast forward a little bit. Tom and I get married. We moved to St. Louis. Tom's in business school Tom was um, in the banking world before Mm -hmm. um, and um, that seemed like a next step in what we were going to do in our lives and uh, the last semester of business school um, was um, they uh, all the students need to write a a business plan and Tom asked for my help and we wrote a business plan on starting a winery together um, which we then decided to go ahead and act upon (laughs) <laughs> um, we didn't think we were going to do that at the time. Okay. Yeah, it's true. Um, <laughs> but we, uh, it was downturn in the economy. It was 2009. Yeah, eight. Um, eight yeah. and nine. Eight, sort of on the cusp of the two because mm-hmm. you got done with business school in March. Of yeah. um, and um, Tom's job offers for, um, for banking were either being revoked because the banks were all going mm-hmm. bankrupt yep. or they were in terrible locations in the United States and I'm not going to say which locations but terrible for me like yep. cities that not, I wasn't not places willing, you were I was willing to, to live to exactly so mm-hmm. the option then came up well maybe we should learn to France and move to France and learn how to make wine learn to France and <laughs> <laughs> learn to France it was it, it yes and it, it, we wanted to do that and yep. it took some time to kind of figure that out and we weren't really sure if that would ever we come went to, to New York and hung out for a little bit and, we and worked, worked yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and we did um I you know was able to get a few consulting slash contract jobs in the finance world mm-hmm. that lasted for like what about six months or so, yeah. and um, we packed up everything, packed up the dog, got on the airplane, and went yeah. to France. And that was that. <laughs> um, <laughs> my family has a house in the Haute Loire, so in the Auvergne region, which okay. is uh, tiny, tiny, so volcanic soils, really beautiful, super rustic and rural. Um, so we had that as home base. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we were also staying in Juliana, mm-hmm. um, and then learning about winemaking in the Maconnais and in um, Beaujolais. Okay. So yeah, the, and in the Maconnais and Beaujolais is where we took um, kind of our wine education courses. Mm-hmm. So, so again, for, for our viewers who don't know these regions, oh, yeah. this is the area that's just north of the city of Lyon. Yep. There's Beaujolais, and then just north of that, the most southern it's part of, of Burgundy, Burgundy, which exactly. is Ma- yeah, the Maconnais. Maconnais. So yeah. mostly white wines mm-hmm. uh, for the Maconnais side, and then mostly red wines for right. the Beaujolais yeah. side. The Gamay grape and Chardonnay grapes. And Chardonnay yeah. grapes. Two of our favorites. Whoa, who right. would have found it? <laughs> um, <laughs> but, how, you know, however, when we moved there, well, Kate was vastly more familiar with Gamay than I was. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's what I grew up drinking. Yeah. actually grew up drinking. And, because and you had lived in this area? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we had the house okay. since I was five. Okay. Yeah, since I was a little girl. And then in the village where where her house, her family's home is, was uh, they grew mostly Gamay, mm-hmm. some Pinot Noir, some Chardonnay. That's it. Yeah, That's pretty much. It. And um, um, so we, you know, for me, I had little experience with Gamay, and so the Beaujolais was like a whole new world, and a beautiful whole new it's world. It's so amazing there too, and something that was a great, great way to learn. But what the reason we went there was because the friend of the person we were working with in the Haute Loire was uh, a wine professor for a school in the Ma- in Macon, and, and then we could take classes there. Yeah, yeah. and so. Cool. He was willing to kind of teach us on the side, so to speak, and so we would get up in the morning and go to his house, and uh, his mother would bring us little cups of coffee, and and we would do enology and viticulture classes, and then in the afternoons we would go. You're missing a huge part of this. What do you mean? That it was all in French. Oh, well, I was about to say. That. <laughs> yes, it was all in French, and this one knows how to translate. <laughs> so not only did Kate. And you know, basically, understand more of what was going, most of what was going on. She retaught, <laughs> you know, immediately right. thereafter, and uh, and helped translate all of our homework while I was, you know, attempting to learn French. <laughs> oh, that's amazing! And that's called so, love. I yes. Think, is so that. beyond her <laughs> winemaking skills, mm-hmm. she deserves, you know, like a Nobel Prize in, you know, basic translation of a 
a scientific subject and then he's <laughs> reteaching it. <laughs> thank you. I think, he learned, I think you learn it twice as much yeah. when you do that. Yes. It's very sweet sure. of you think you know that. It's very nice. Um, but it was a great experience because it was both the like proper education mm-hmm. where we were learning about mind biology, learning about what was going on, like what was going on behind the scenes, and that's you know fundamental knowledge that you really can't get any other way. And then spending our afternoons and weekends, you know, working in vineyards or visiting suppliers or seeing all the other actual working aspects, the more practical based part of and then, industry. And then our um, schooling was, I think it was awesome. Um, we would have, you know, intensive class mm-hmm. time and then intensive on like hands-on yeah. stage time that were sort of intermixed like month and month and month. Um, so you were actually getting to apply the things you had been yeah. talking about so, uh, uh, throughout the year. So the term stage is intern, uh, is intern, intern or something, exactly, right? Okay. Yeah, internship, yep. yeah, externship, something along those lines. Yeah. Um, and then, so that, we completed, uh, we came back to the States and actually we went back for a little bit more time. So we hadn't quite completed. The, the entire cycle, yeah. exactly. So we went back for more wine work, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and moved to Oregon mm-hmm. uh, right after that. Um, now, what brought you to Oregon? There was this discussion earlier of that glass of, or that, that bottle well, of wine on that date. So but one of the things that there's happened... There was another date, yeah, actually. Okay. There, was a, <laughs> yes. there was another date. So when, while we were in California, before we had gone to graduate, I yeah. had uh, gone to graduate school. No, it was during graduate school. Was that one mm-hmm. of the Yeah, yeah, but we, yeah so it was during graduate okay. school. Okay. So we went on Monday because we're super poor and that's the cheapest day. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so we went to Chez Panisse. The way we remember these things. <laughs> yes. Like, the dates are starting to get tasty. Okay, they so, so Chez Panisse, great restaurant in awesome. Northern California. Awesome. If you start on Monday, the tasting menu gets more expensive as you go. Yeah, throughout the week. There we so go. Monday I believe it was about $55. I think it was. <laughs> and I remember exactly what we had. We had a uh, seafood fish sausage. sausage. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> And Babo Alum, yeah. and we had a bottle of Eastern wine. There you go, another mm-hmm. another Oregon, Oregon wine. Yeah. Yeah. And recommended the by mm-hmm. the Pusac, recommended by the Somme. Sure. Uh, we told them the style of wines mm-hmm. we liked, and so. And we'd never really done this before, but afterwards we were so impressed with the wine, we sent an email to Less Russ Rainey. Russ Rainey uh-huh. okay. and Russ called. So Russ is the the founder and the original yeah, winemaker exactly. of Eastern Wood, yeah, and, one of and the, a true pioneer in mm-hmm. Oregon, and one of the best winemakers I know. Yeah. And he's one of the sweetest guys. Well, he was influenced by a Burgundian, so mm-hmm. I mean, and go. some German. And he's oh, also and from St. Louis. He yes. actually learned in Germany. Yeah, that's right. And he grew up in the same community in St. Louis that I did. Grew up in. And he knew all my dad's friends, so we had this really cool connection. And um, he invited Kate and I to come and visit. visit and stay at his home, and that him and his wife uh, Mary would yeah. kind of show us around. And so after some amount of time we decided to take him up on that and and when we we came he you know kind of pulled no stops and mm-hmm. we went and visited with Everybody. some great vineyards and mm-hmm. yeah. he, had, he arranged a dinner with us and the, um, Steve Dorner of Kristen Wines mm-hmm. and Brian O'Donnell of Belpont and John Paul of Cameron and Scott Wright of Scott Paul and it was just like this <laughs> <laughs> who's who we were just kind of completely overwhelmed by the entire experience um but so when we were thinking about starting our careers in wine seriously i mean everything pointed to Oregon yeah. from the beginning well in if, the strangest if, if way nothing did until that point having that experience Parents of meeting have, all mm-hmm. of those people and and, and learning just, about their past yeah. and saying to ourselves like this is something we could get. Yeah. And also, I mm-hmm. think that the regions where we made wine in France, when we come to visit Oregon, there was just, it was almost like a trifecta of the three combined. Yeah. Uh, when we look at it, because it doesn't look like Burgundy here, um, but it has, you know, it has those parallels. Mm-hmm. Um, it actually resembles or those more, laterals. The yeah. laterals, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Let's talk about the right lines, Kate. Um, but, and then it actually looks more like where I grew up in the Loire, but mm-hmm. it yeah. also the has, region, yeah. the, it has similarities to Beaujolais too. Yeah. It has all these aspects. It was sort of the three, was it just look, it felt so familiar. It really yes. did. So, so I want, I want to take what you're talking about and fast forward to where we are now mm-hmm. and what's going on in this facility especially because we're in the middle of Oregon where Pinot Noir is the grape, right? Mm-hmm. But that's not the only thing that this place focuses on. There's 17 varietals that are yeah, we, we just actually figured that out today <laughs> because somebody asked us. <laughs> yeah. We don't just normally know this number, right. but we actually sat down with a pencil paper because mm-hmm. somebody asked us, how many varietals do you make? 
Were they? Well, so when we were sort of counting, I think that I've gotten to fourteen before <laughs> okay, and been yeah, like, yeah. oh, I know I'm missing something. I, I did forget, you? Did I, you remember like the, the muscat Arne. in there? Yeah, I got okay, the, muscat. Okay. the muscat and the arnais were the ones. Were the two that, that were like, like ah. Now seventeen mm-hmm. different varieties or varietals, depending yeah. on made with your, ten winemakers. Your, your end of the the, mm-hmm. the argument on which is the proper term, but uh, um, uh, ten different winemakers. So I, I want to talk about that and talk about the collective mm-hmm. first, and then let's talk about this range of things that are actually made here and the influence behind it all, because I think it's really fascinating. So the collective started off, um, we wanted to make wine in town, Mm -hmm. and um, every space we looked at was too small or too big, you know, and and so it sort of evolved into this thought of how we make this work, but also who are we as people, what makes sense, and sort of that sort of convivial, ooh, what are you doing? (laughs) Um, That sort of convivial nature led us to think about having more people involved Mm -hmm. in in a sort of more community and then also having a large enough space allows us to fill it too yeah. which we've certainly done yeah. it's full. we have now but i mean two years or three years ago this, this was we were like yeah. oh it's going to take us a decade to fill this place yeah. out well, it's amazing how that <laughs> 18 happens. months later that's right. the yeah. story but um, um so we really wanted to create a space that could that would work for people like us that were making wine smaller brands mm-hmm. that didn't necessarily have um, the size or necessarily the capital or the access. weight or the access yeah. to being able to have their own equipment. Yep. Um, and there were, there's lots of us like that. And there's not that many places where you can make your own wine mm-hmm. and do that. Um, so that thought uh, of our job as winemakers is to make great wine, but also sort of to incubate the future of winemaking too. Yeah. Uh, to really be able to promote Oregon and a new generation of winemakers. And then also to have it be... Um, in a space that would allow our clientele really good access Mm -hmm. to wine. Um, Wine is a luxury uh, in itself, but doesn't have to be, I think, because I drink wine every day, and if I expect my clients to do that too, then Mm -hmm. I need to make it easy for them to do so. So let's put it right in the middle of town where they can walk here. Um, So I I think one of your first questions, I think the byproduct of this younger group of you know, highly so you, ambitious. You started winemakers. off with how many different uh, members of the collective? Five. So there's to start five, off five to start five off with. with. Yeah. Four that were kind of currently rolling, and one mm-hmm. that was just starting. Mm-hmm. And um, we've since grown to ten winemakers. Okay. And you've had some leave, leave and actually open their we've other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. we've had, yeah. we've had one winemaker yeah. go, and their their business uh, has been growing yeah. incredibly fast, and yeah. it's amazing to see what they're what they're doing. Uh, other than that, everybody else is, is just grown. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so the the you know the kind of byproduct of all of these you know young you know, s- you know super ambitious winemakers who've got great ideas mm-hmm. is varietals beyond the most dominant grape of the region, Pinot Noir, and. 17 of them, I guess. <laughs> well, I think that that's something that we talk about uh, amongst ourselves is it's that... It's 18, I just forgot one. Oh, no. Which one? Milan. Milan, 18. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that uh, Pinot Noir put Oregon on the map in a mm-hmm. major way. And there's it, it is king here. Like, there's no doubt. But we're just at the infancy of our winemaking. Uh, and I think America as a whole is still in an infancy in, yeah. a, in a sense Maybe compared. Maybe we're now. just want to make sure that we're still rolling. The, uh, yep, we are. Okay. You're good? Okay, yep. good. Um, and so <laughs> there's, there's so much more reach. There's so much more potential with mm-hmm. the soils we have here and the climates. And also the Pacific Northwest yep. in general. So that's really, I think, where that sort of large list of varietals. When you say Pacific from. Northwest in general, I, uh, I'm assuming that's because there is some Washington fruit that comes in here as yeah. well. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. And we've yeah. got, yeah. East, well, that in Eastern Oregon yep. and Southern Oregon, Central Oregon, mm-hmm. which each have their own, you know, microclimates and mm-hmm. soil and differentiation. Mm-hmm. And we have such access to those places that it would be a shame for us not sure. to be mm-hmm. able to, to to tap into them and to be able to show their beauty also. Uh, if, if you're interested in a varietal and it's grown there, then might as well make wine out yeah. of it, so. Yeah, and so our, our, the winemakers of the collective have been, you know, have shown a real interest in um, reaching beyond the most traditional grapes that have kind of been what Oregon has built mm-hmm. its name on. And, um, and even more importantly, coming up with fantastic results. Mm-hmm. and. Um, so to us, this is just like 
the next chapter in a really interesting story that has been started for now, you know, 45 years or yep. so. But actually that chapter started early. It's funny because when Oregon was first planted, these mm-hmm. rattles were planted yeah. because they're, they're here, you yep. know? But then everyone bringing sort them of to light bringing light. them to light right. or reviving them. How about, right. yeah, bringing exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and focusing on them, um, I think, is what's interesting yeah. to us. Um, and then also... Uh, it, you know, the, a, a good story, though, is um, there's a guy, Myron Anderson, who started Amity Vineyards in mm-hmm. the late 70s, and uh, we work a lot with the Gamay Grape, and he came to one of our events and was like, oh, when I started here in the 70s and we planted Gamay, he's like, I couldn't give it away, mm-hmm. you know, and, and he's like, I can't believe, you know, that people are actually wanting to plant more of this sure. now, and it's, it's you know, so, it's just a kind of, I guess, a tell of the times how how um, you know sometimes something doesn't stick the first time yeah. but the second time around or the third time around it might gain some traction and it was a really kind of cool conversation to see about the history of this grape and that it has been around since the beginning of the Oregon wine industry mm-hmm. but it's just maybe now kind of but there were a couple there are a handful of really good winemakers that have been making gamay really well the for for the last 10 years but at the same time but the, but the main, focus yeah. is now there's there's actually some interest well the the, the, the culture and the um, the world of wine consumers has changed over all of that period of time yes. as well and I think that there's involved. more curiosity more interest more awareness of exactly. you know, and, and I think that one of the things that you guys are doing um, to help that process along is you're not only serving uh, we're, we're sitting in your, your tasting room right mm-hmm. now. You're not only serving the wines that you guys produce, um, all, all 17 or 18, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> uh, varietals, but, um, Other but you're also um, presenting side by side with a lot of the European influences of the mm-hmm. wines that are being made here as well. We call yes. them our inspirations. Yes, yeah. and, um, and I think that that may help the process as well for people to really understand all of what's going on here in context. I think yeah. it's, context is exactly mm-hmm. it. I, I think what I like with wines is finding where something fits mm-hmm. in the grand scheme or maybe where it doesn't or being able to compare, yeah. um, you know, old world and then, I mean, we're considered new world. That's mm-hmm. where we're from. Even though I think the styles of the wines that are made here at the winery are relatively more influenced by old world winemaking. Yeah. Um, it's still really beautiful to see those side by side um, and interesting too. I mean, I get really bored drinking my wine all the time, so um, <laughs> it's really it's nice to be able to do that. And um, I think that it shows that we talk about community. Mm-hmm. It shows that wine is community. Yeah. It really is. And so. there's even like a sub community within these you know four walls and all the winemakers that work here and the the people that work for the winery and all of us, you know. We get to experience new wines together, and it really also builds on our kind of perspective and abilities to be able to, you know, knowing more about different wines from around the world. You know, talking with our peer winemakers here about things that they've had and things that they're working on. It, it's a it's a great environment. It's mm-hmm. a great environment to learn from and grow from for, you know us and wine and I would hope anybody who's interested in it. And for us, I think that it sort of reflects Portland. There's mm-hmm. a curiosity in Portland. Uh, people like to know where everything's from. Sure. Who made it? You know, the name of the chicken. You know, that's like, <laughs> like a huge... Carl, our wine barrel over here. Exactly. People are just into that here and I think that that's not just a trend. It is yeah. how it is here. Uh, and it should be. Mm-hmm. I think it's important. Um, and so, why not know exactly where your wine is made? Uh, we have you know big glass doors. You can watch. You can and it. You walk through the winery to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Like that yeah. just happens. Um, it's uh, very transparent, and I think it allows people to connect with something. Sure. And while I said earlier that it's a luxury and that it shouldn't be, mm-hmm. it's it, it should be more basic than that. It should you should be able to feel, touch, smell, understand, and we, that's what we're trying to do. And, you, and I think you've done a great job of making it accessible and making it. Fun too. So, but uh, we, we're coming to the end of our time together, and I want to make sure that we talk about your wine label oh, yes. okay, a little bit <laughs> to, to know what you're doing now. Um, congratulations on a, a great mention coverage in the New York Times recently. That was very exciting to see you opening up. It's very humbling. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, tell me a little bit about uh, the label, how that how that all came about, what you guys focus on specifically. 
Um, so division yep. is named after where we live. Mm -hmm. So Tom and I live six blocks from here. Okay. Uh, and so in our very French way, mm -hmm. we named our wine label after our village. Okay. Division is the, the main street. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yep. exactly. Um, and uh, so that started, we're, we just completed our fifth vintage. I yeah. cannot believe this. this I, didn't even, I didn't even really realize it till last night. That's we were talking about. Like, what? So you started Five. making the wine elsewhere before. Yeah, we did. So we did three years. Uh, two, two, two and a half. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, down in the valley. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I, I was working for a, a winery in the Olamide Hills, and Kate was working for another winery, um, and it was a a very precocious time for the wine industry and just the American economy mm -hmm. in general. And so um, uh, the family we were working for, you know, they. They were really looking for help, but they also was hopeful that we could they could trade some of their wine space and their grapes for a part of the compensation, which kind of gave us a, an entry point yeah. that we weren't really even we weren't expecting, expecting that year. And we ex yeah, we were just, uh, making wine. Yeah, so we were making wine, <laughs> and uh, so we started division mm -hmm. um, uh, with what we saw as a wine that we loved. Or grew, I especially grew to love, and Kate had already loved mm -hmm. in France. In France, which was rosé, our bright, crisp, dry rosé. Oh. And, Minerality, um, citrus palette, exactly. the whole thing. A little and bit 2010 was like a perfect year yeah. for it. It oh, was so cool, good. and the wines had, or the grapes had vibrancy and acid, mm -hmm. and so uh, it was kind of twofold. Yeah. Um, we got these grapes as compensation, and we were also thinking about what could turn around <laughs> make money the quickest and mm -hmm. rosé has a a good turnaround yeah. period and so um it was a kind of a cool way to get started we didn't have enough grapes to put in the press mm -hmm. so we uh, kate and i uh, foot. foot pressed it <laughs> and uh like old school way right and, uh, and it, it did really well it, it was really it was amazing um 60 cases of rosé mm -hmm. started the started the business started the business that's cool. true and, um, and some chardonnay and some pinot also. yeah they came a little and later some gamay also yeah, yeah. Yeah, a little bit of gamay. There was some gamay planted at the um, at the vineyard and winery where we were working, and so we begged. <laughs> to have it was, some. It, was, it, it was wasn't being blended. It wasn't the, yeah, the It was just going. Yeah. yeah. And so we were we were like, you know, this is you've got this great grape here. Mm -hmm. We should, and yeah, you know, they had limited knowledge of the gamay grape, and so we were like, hey, we have plenty of knowledge. We had plenty of knowledge. Well, from yeah. yes, well, I mean, plenty, not yeah. that much, but still learning more yeah. more so mm -hmm. than. Yes. And um, so that's kind of really what really got, got us going. And so now Division, um, you know, we make the wine here at the Southeast Wine Collective. And we make... With our other bandmates. Yes. And did, did we count the varietals this morning? I'm laughing. We have seven Division varietals. Yeah, that's right. And um, they're mostly focused on the regions where, where Kate and I you know, lived and worked in wine in mm -hmm. the old world. So in Burgundy, Beaujolais, and parts of the Loire. Mm -hmm. So we have... Gamay, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Chenin Blanc, and Cabernet Capra. Franc. But you made a little Grenache this year. Well, this year, but that hasn't seen the light of day. Yet. And you've made, we made Riesling. And, we and, have, and you've I made, made Syrah. Syrah. Oh, so, nice. technically. Okay, Syrah, okay so, Syrah. so, so you, there we go. We've dabbled in other things, but <laughs> the four of these. But business. that's the four. Yeah. Yeah. But, but really focused on Loire uh, and Burgundy and yeah. Beaujolais. The ones that we love to drink, I think mm -hmm. that's what it comes down to. Um, and what this area, I think, is really good at yeah. exactly good at growing mm -hmm. it's our sunshine and rain here so yeah, yeah. um so yeah so that's that's us that's what we do year number five year cool. five <laughs> good job there you go a high five for year number five <laughs> yeah, yeah perfect yeah, yeah. perfect well this this has been a fabulous introduction to you guys to what you've built here what you're continuing uh to develop here and um uh i guess the the last question i have for you is um how do people discover you? Where do people come and look for you? Uh, it's a well, if you're in Portland, mm -hmm. coming to us physically here is a, a great way to so experience both the wine bar, us the collective, and yeah. the other collective winemakers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, beyond so Portland, and um, you know, we're been really excited that the the division has now grown to. Um, 13 states now oh, great. and um, we and try to Canada. and Canada and we try to keep the the that updated on our website and um, so that website is division yeah, division wine making company company com. Com. great we'll put a link next to the video Perfect. Yes. thank and you and then se wine collective.com yeah. for the winery we'll put a link and always you know well. if you're if you want to know more we're really open mm -hmm. 
you can email us. And, Our emails you know, are right on the website. Exactly. <laughs> we're happy to try to try to connect with our wines, with people that maybe are in states where the wines are not, or yeah. whatever else we can answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, terrific. You, you guys have a, a, a fabulous story. It's We're just in the middle of the story, or, or maybe <laughs> just at the beginning of the story. Toddler, toddler. Exactly. Let's go with that toddler exactly. yeah. moment. I think we're two right. here, so yeah. So clearly this is just our first conversation of what I hope will be many, and, okay. I, and, I, and I know that there's going to be lots Please of come more anytime. exciting stuff to come. <laughs> so, hey. Kate and Tom Monroe, thank you so much for joining me and allowing me to come into your space today and uh, have this conversation. No, I really appreciate thank you. it. Thank you, was it fun? I, I, it was I, fun. I really <laughs> am looking forward to seeing this. I'm looking forward to seeing how these all evolve because well, right. well, you've got so much. such a wealth of people to, to reach out to. Too. Well, terrific. Thanks, thanks. guys. Thanks. Yeah. Cheers.